We're talking today with Dick Stravers of Holland, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. All right. Okay, so Dick, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Okay, I was born on a farm 12 miles north of Pella, Iowa. We were very poor. We had no electricity until I was a senior in high school. We had no running water, no, no plumbing in the house, so we used an outhouse for going to the, the bathroom. Okay. Uh, in what year were you born? In 1927. Okay. And it was November 7, and it was cold, and we had a, a wood-burning cook stove, and that's what kept our house warm, and the story goes that I was I was only four and a half pounds, so I was put in a shoe box and put behind the kitchen stove to keep me warm. Right. <laughs> and and I was the fifth of five brothers mm -hmm. and seven years later a sister was born and oh. my brothers are all dead and my sister still lives and she lives in Boston. Okay. And, all right. Now you you're born in twenty seven, and that's yeah. right, and that's right before the Great Depression starts. Yes. Uh, yes. What was life like on your farm during the thirties? Then, as you said, you were poor. Very poor, but we had because we were on a farm. But it was a small farm, mm -hmm. and not not uh, the best farmland in the world. Um, but because of that, we had things to eat, but. My dad bought the farm um, from a neighbor at pre-depression prices, mm -hmm. and when the depression hit, he was not able to make the payments, and this man's friend said, why don't you foreclose? You're not getting any money. He said, I would never do that. and then. With Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, he was able to get a federal sponsored loan, I mm -hmm. guess, and but the payments were so small that he was paying for that small farm the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> so, but you got to keep the farm. We got mean. to keep the farm. Right? All right. Okay. Now, um, and how long did you go? How much education did you have okay. before the service? Okay, I went, uh, everyone in my family went to a one-room country school. We had, we walked three-quarters of a mile um, every day to that in all kinds of weather. Mm -hmm. And this one-room school, we had, when I was there, 36 students in my class, that, that was kindergarten through grade eight. And my class had six students. That was the biggest class in mm -hmm. the school. And one teacher, uh, and my favorite teacher was Miss Mildred Kaisen. She was just absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and my dad went, oh, he only went through the third grade, but when I was a seventh grader and an eighth grader, he was president of the school board. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, did you go to high school? Yes, went to high school in Pella, Iowa, Pella Public High School. Mm -hmm. They have, had a Christian high school there too, but I went to Pella Public High School, okay. and for the first two years, I lived with a farmer right on the edge of town, and in the morning before going to school, I would milk the cows, feed mm -hmm. the pigs, feed the chickens, and. And when I got home in the afternoon, I would repeat all of that, mm -hmm. and I lived with them, and, and the wife and mother was a wonderful cook, so I, I ate with them, and I was fed fabulously. So I did all that work, for, and got room and board, mm -hmm. and a five dollar stipend every week. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> now you did that for two years? I did that for two years. Then for the last two years, I thought, that's enough. I don't want to milk cows before and after school mm -hmm. anymore. So then I went to work for a, 
uh, dairy uh, milk processing mm -hmm. place. And so I would, on a machine, would wash bottles and do all kinds of errands. And, and that, that owner was so good to me, and that was during gas rationing. And so I lived 12, my home was 12 miles away, mm -hmm. but I lived in town when I worked for him, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, and every Saturday, he would give me one of his ration stamps for gasoline, which was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. It was a little bonus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that enabled your parents to come pick you up? No, I had... I actually had an old car okay. that I bought. <laughs> yeah. right. So that so was that, that was a good thing. All and right. then in the summertime, I would work for neighbors um, a day here and a day there on the farms around. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would work um, hoeing the weeds out of a garden and mowing the lawn. Work all day for seventy-five cents. <laughs> so, well, seventy-five cents went farther then than it does now. So. Well, yes, <laughs> yes, and I was very frugal, so I had more money than anybody in the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, um, by the time Pearl Harbor happens, you'd have yes. been about fourteen. Do you remember how you heard about that? Yes, um, we were in our kitchen, and we didn't have electricity, so we had a radio that uh, ran on, on a car battery, was hooked up to a car battery, mm -hmm. and we heard that news on a Sunday afternoon, and it was really devastating. Yeah. Okay. Now, were any of your brothers in the service at that time? Not at that time, okay. but um, four of the five of us went into the military, mm -hmm. and my oldest brother served uh, um, really in China, and I think it was called Persia then. Mm -hmm. He he drove a, a wrecker, and they would go over mountain roads delivering um, products that would end up in Russia. Mm -hmm. and very dangerous mountain roads. And, and when he uh, sailed uh, out of our country, his wife and uh, young son didn't hear a word for him, from him for three and a half months until he arrived wherever he was mm -hmm. going to. And it was a, yeah, it was a sad, scary time. Mm -hmm. Life was hard for him, and my uh, second brother was a f was a four F because he had a cyst in his neck, which mm -hmm. never was a problem in any way whatsoever. But he wanted so badly badly to be in the military, uh, they wouldn't draft him, and he tried to enlist in all the services, and nobody would take him. And then my th third uh, oldest brother joined the Navy. He didn't have a job and uh, he knew he was going to be drafted, so he joined the Navy and served in several bad battles. He was on an aircraft carrier mm -hmm. and he thought he would never survive, but he did. But yeah, okay. he once, once when the planes were returning to the aircraft carrier, for some reason, they, they had not dropped their bombs, but when they hit the aircraft carrier, the bombs started to go started to go off, which they never should have, and it just wrecked the deck, and several people were killed. Mm -hmm. It was my brother. Who, who, that was a traumatic thing for the rest of his life, actually. And then a brother just older than I uh, was drafted into the Army Air Force, but he never left the country. Mm -hmm. so, okay. And and that's and now 
shall I tell about what, how I got into the military? That would be the logical next step, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I was in Bella High School, and when we became seniors, um, we knew we would be drafted into the Occupation Army mm -hmm. or Navy, because the war was over. And so 11 of us said, why don't we just enlist? And we could enlist in the regular army for 18 months. Mm -hmm. And that sounded good. One of the uh, uh, 11 uh, uh, enlisted for three years, the rest of us for 18 months. And then, and then for, I worked for the, that summer before I enlisted, and then after we had enlisted, well, the Army came to get us, and we got our picture on the front page of the Pella Chronicle, <laughs> and, and we took the train to Fort Snelling, Minnesota, near Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and there we had our physicals, and we went, did some tests of different kinds, and then then they send us back home, and, and then we went back to Fort Snelling again later on, and then from there we went to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, which I think is closed now. Mm -hmm. That's where we got our uniforms. That's where we were sworn in on September 15, 1946, and every one of us said the last place we want to go to is Camp Polk, Louisiana. Well, that's where I went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in September, hotter than blazes, and we had winter clothing. Okay. Now, how did they, how did they get you from uh, Fort Sheridan down to oh, uh, Fort Polk? Oh, good. A troop train. We slept on the train, ate on the train. Yes. And, uh, and what else did I want to say? And that was the first time, no, the second time I had been east of the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. The second time in my life because I went to a youth convention in Grand Rapids, Michigan once. That's mm -hmm. the only time I was east of the river. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then when you were taking that train ride uh, down to Louisiana, yeah. um, could you get off the train periodically at the no. station? No. They just no, kept you on no, the whole time? No. It, it was traveled mostly at night mm -hmm. at all, no, but we, we we were fed on the train, we slept on the train, and one of the wonderful things uh, that occurred to me many times after, uh, I'd never missed a meal any time I was in the military, mm -hmm. never missed a meal. They were, that was amazing how they accomplished that. All right. So uh, you got down to Fort Polk, uh, and you said it was hot. It was September. hot with all these hot clothes okay. and army boots. Okay. Now, when you arrived there, what kind of reception did you get? What happens to you after you get off the oh, train? I got off the train, and then I, I think we all gathered somewhere, and we were assigned into different barracks, mm -hmm. and so then we went to the barracks, and and I think our beds were all made up already, or we had to make them, I don't know, and we had to make them very well, mm -hmm. <laughs> and hung up our clothes, and, and got to know each other a little bit, and then probably the next day already we uh, started our training, got up, I think, 5 o'clock in the morning, and, uh, and, and nothing to do at night, so we went to bed early, and during, during basic training you usually lose weight. I gained 20 pounds. <laughs> okay. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I think it's because I got more sleep. Uh, I was dating my wife. Um, Ruth at that time, and the nights were short, mm -hmm. so I didn't sleep a lot, <laughs> and, 
not as much as I should, so things went just the opposite direction, direction for me. I gained weight. Yeah. All right. Now, what did the actual basic training consist of? Well, the basic training was supposed to take about 12 to 13 weeks, mm -hmm. but after four and a half weeks, they closed that camp, and we have indeed haven't, hadn't even gone to the rifle range. And so we said, are we going to go overseas or what? Oh, no, you won't go overseas until you've been to a rifle range somewhere. Well, they sent us home for seven days, and then we were uh, boarded a regular train, not a troop train, and and went to Camp, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, okay. K-I-L-M-E-R, okay. New Jersey. Right. Now, before and, we before we continue, let's back up a little. Yes. Bit. All right. Um, when you were training during those four and a half yeah. weeks, what things did they make you do? Oh, we we ran. We took long hikes with all our gear. Maybe, maybe the longest one was twelve miles, I think, and having grown up on a farm that was so easy mm -hmm. for me but for kids from the cities like New York City and Boston man they could hardly do those hikes mm -hmm. and, and we ran and did calisthenics and and uh, chin-ups I guess you called them mm -hmm. yes lots mostly physical stuff mm -hmm. and the the training sergeant, sometimes we really thought very ill of them, uh, of him, and that's usually how it goes. They have to be tough, you right. know. And <laughs> All right. And now, they were. now, what did the sergeants do if, if people messed up? Oh, make it do KP or just get chewed out like crazy in front of everybody mm -hmm. and, and we had to march we had to learn to march in formation mm -hmm. and and for me I like that I thought boy learning this is this is wonderful mm -hmm. to left 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 right left and if you screwed up, which some still did, <laughs> it was so simple. Oh, then the sergeant would really chew you out. Mm -hmm. He'd maybe call you, call you out of the formation. Out of the formation, yeah, and and just talk to you nose to nose. <laughs> yeah. So our military, but basic training was a very shortened thing. Right. And yeah. So you got physical training and you learn discipline and marching, basically. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now let's go back to Camp Kilmer then. Yes. Uh, what happens once you get there? Well, uh, when we got there, then we found out we were going to go overseas, and uh, and they didn't tell us until the night before that we were going to go to Italy, and I said, "Oh my goodness." I'm, I didn't know much about Italy, <laughs> but then we we went to Italy on a troop ship, a Liberty ship, which mm -hmm. they built in those days, and it took us 13 days to get to Livorno, that's how the Italians say it, mm -hmm. but we said Leghorn, right. and some of the bridges were still out, but, but, even, but even there, go back to the food, we never missed a meal, and we... Uh, can you talk about the trip uh, on the Liberty ship? Uh, what kind of weather did you have? What was oh, that like? Going over there, it was it was pretty, pretty decent, it, and I regret the fact that I didn't have some good books to read, because you just, you just sat around doing nothing, looking at the, the dolphins, and... Uh, other kinds of things, fish in the, in the ocean, and so it was such a new experience. It was it was quite wonderful, except we slept down in the holds, and 
Boy, the air down there was not very good. <laughs> and okay. Did the men get seasick? Oh, man, yes. Some would lie under the exhaust fans day after day, and just as if they were dead. I was seasick one day each direction, mm -hmm. but that summer's seasick the whole way over. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So when did you arrive in Italy? Well, then 13 days later. So, well, interesting. Going over to Italy on the troop ship, we had Thanksgiving dinner on the ship. Okay. And I thought, isn't this amazing? We were having turkey uh, on the ship. My family back home, they're all together having turkey to or probably mm -hmm. chicken. And and then it, I remember it was pretty rough because we had to hang on to our trays or they'd slide <laughs> off the table or wherever we were. The food would go flying, and which did happen. And uh, and it was so, so that was, yeah, it was kind of an exciting experience. Okay. And then we got into the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and that was calm. Mm -hmm. And man, we we could see Gibraltar, mm -hmm. and then we could see Africa mm -hmm. on the right. It was dark when we went through there, but we could see those things. And I thought, this is amazing that I'm getting to see all these things. It was just super. And and then we got to Livorno, and they put us on the train and still we didn't know where we were going to end up but um, shall I tell about that train ride? Sure, yes. We got on the train well we had we had a meal uh, right outside before we boarded the train mm -hmm. and I remember it was a pretty good meal. Got on the train and they directed us to particular cars so they had a plan. So the, the the car I was in, well then the, the train moved and it would stop and let off empty one of the cars and that's mm -hmm. where those people were going to be stationed. And then we'd go somewhat farther, another car, and I happened to be on a car that went all the way to the Julian Alps the northeastern part of Italy mm -hmm. where Austria and then Yugoslavia connected and up in the Julian Alps just before Christmas snow like you could not believe it was like a wonderland mm -hmm. and we went through between Trieste and Tarabizio which is now a ski resort mm -hmm. um, the mountain there in the Julian Alps were absolutely fabulously beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh man, we we all were stretching our necks to see. We had never seen anything like that in our life. So we got to this little town of Tarbizio, the last car to empty, and uh, they didn't know just what what company we were going to be in that then yet we had to be interviewed and um, before they decided that so the first night we were there maybe the first two or three nights we slept in a big building that probably had been a hospital with the windows broken out no heat oh, oh man and cold we put we put our overcoats and everything possible over us to stay warm and in the in the lower level of that building I've thought of that um, a number of times the, the guys who were there not permanently but they were they were helping helping us all get situated and they had a plastic they had a plastic thing over a fire that they built, uh, not a fireplace, but mm -hmm. they built. I thought, man, they could have been asphyxiated. Yeah. But <laughs> there it was warm, but but very dangerous. Well, then we got interviewed, and they said, oh, you grew up on a farm. You'd be a good um, 
uh, ski trooper. I said, not I. I said, <laughs> I'm a book person. <laughs> and, well, are you able to type? I said, yes, I had two years of typing in high school. So, so I was put into an office to take care of the, the minutes and a lot of other stuff for one particular company. And, and while I was there, we stayed in what had been an orphanage. It was a, a lovely place, and uh, there were probably 12 of us in a room. And I remember the guy, one, a guy next to me, on my right side, he had tended to drink a little too much. And he was a different nationality, but I'm not going to tell you what. He would get so drunk, he would fall right out of bed. <laughs> and they knew that I was not one who drank alcohol. I never had a swallow of alcohol in the 18 months I was in the Army. I was a teetotaler because that was a big problem. Mm -hmm. So then I loved it. I loved my job. And, but I thought, I got to do something else in addition to that job, because I, I wasn't chasing women and I wasn't going out drinking. So I got a self-help book where you so teach yourself something. For some crazy reason, I chose to study um, um, shorthand. Interesting, and that was easy to learn. I was studying shorthand, so one day the lieutenant in charge came to me and said, Corporal Stravers, um, I understand you like shorthand, and that's your study again. I said, I am. He said, well, we got to send two of you to Caserta, that's 15 miles out of Naples, send you down there for a 13-week class in shorthand. <laughs> I said, are you interested? I said, of course. That sounded interesting. So then two of us went down to that class, and we were there. The plan was we would study shorthand in the morning, and we were free five days a week, and then we were free the rest of the time. But they, Found, when they found out I knew how to type, then they asked me to help the typing teachers teach typing. So that was like a 13-week vacation, really. And I graduated the head of the class. Well, there you go. Now, um, just to back up a little yes. bit, uh, what actual unit were you assigned to? Oh, that was the 351st Infantry Re Regiment part of uh, the 88th Division, okay. Army Division, Infantry Division, right. and I was connected with the, the regimental headquarters. Okay, so yes. you were headquarters company. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, uh, when you're in Naples, so you basically had a kind of full-time day job at that point, because you were teaching typing yes. in the afternoon Five and taking... Five days a week, yes. Okay. Now, Naples at that period of time was famous for being a place where you could get into a lot of trouble. Yes. There were women, there were bars, oh. there was a black market, there was all of this stuff. But yes. you were a good guy. So how did you spend your time? <laughs> well, there, uh, well, I should say this. <clears throat> Most of us were just right out of high school. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in the occupation army I suppose that was true everywhere, and mm -hmm. it surely was true in Italy. And most of the guys, when they got situated in Italy, they just went banana, bananas. Mm -hmm. they, they, they went to prostitutes, they went drinking. Total, uh, their lives totally changed. and and by the grace of God, mine did not. And when they knew some of the guys, when they knew they were going to get drunk, 
and spend their money, they would give their money to me mm -hmm. to keep it so they wouldn't spend it all. Yeah. And Naples was, yeah, that's the place where I ate my first pizza mm -hmm. in Naples. But that Bay of Naples, if that's what it's called, mm -hmm. oh, it was so beautiful. Have you been to Naples? I've not been to Naples. No. Oh, absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and so the uh, army uh, took us there once in a while, and they even took us to Rome uh, for a weekend, and so we got to, we got to see a lot of Rome, and yeah. Okay. Did they take you to Pompeii? They did, to Pompeii, you betcha, yeah. and <laughs> that was interesting, and, and to the Isle of Capri. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, yeah, yeah. but we spent a couple of nights there that was absolutely wonderful. And they told us then, and when my wife and me went back to go to each of those places in uh, 1983, um, they said those ferries that run from Naples to Capri, they're owned and operated by the Mafia, mm -hmm. that's what they said. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they picture oh, of him is right. Okay, yeah. So and the and the the ocean between Naples and Capri was really wild. It it was scary. Mm -hmm. The old ship rocked like crazy. <laughs> All right. Okay. So your, your time in Naples then really was kind of a 13-week vacation, or at least yep, you yep. got to do a lot of interesting things. It okay. was. It was. Now, after you finish that 13 weeks, then yeah. what do you do? Then, while I was in shorthand school, then the um, company I was with left um, Tarvisio, that little town, mm -hmm. left Tarvisio and moved to Trieste. I think the Italians maybe call it Trieste, mm -hmm. but we called it Trieste. And so then the rest of my time in Italy was spent there. We slept in um, Quonset huts and we didn't have, well, the discipline in the army was relaxed because the war was over mm -hmm. and and the Italians respected us. They were grateful for what America had done, and so it was a it was a, a happy time to be there. And in my entire 18 months in the army, I, I've often said one of the best periods of of time in my life. I loved it and was so grateful for it, actually. And besides, the GI Bill paid for my college education <laughs> and just, just after serving 18 months, an easy 18 months. Now, what kind of condition was the city of Trieste in? Was it still pretty much intact, or was there war damage? Um, no, not in Trieste, no. I, I imagine there was some, but no, it was not in shambles. Mm -hmm. And then we, there was a, um, a Red Cross, um, like a, a coffee house, mm -hmm. right downtown on, and on the ocean with the Trieste is right at the end of the Adriatic right. Sea. We'd go down there for donuts and ice cream, mm -hmm. and we, and uh, where we were stationed in the Quonsada was on a hill overlooking Trieste. And there were always American ships in dock there that we would ride a, um, a train, I think, I don't know what we called it, but it would go take us down that big hill mm -hmm. and come back and, and we would smell the garlic. On the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the Italians rode it as well as we did. And, and, but while we were there, um, May 1 in many of those countries, that's, that's a special day. Well, Tito was a, uh, the head of 
Yugoslavia and Trieste had been given back to Italy mm -hmm. uh, after the war. Uh, Yugoslavia had taken it, I think. I don't know there was a, after World War I, it was a disputed area between yeah. Italy and Yugoslavia, and the yeah. League of Nations had yeah. a mandate there, yeah. and so it had been kind of back and forth. Yeah. And then while we were, well, we were in Trieste, living in the Squanza Nuts, and our office, my office was in a big house. Uh, I was in an office with a master sergeant and a first lieutenant, and the, the head of the uh, regiment, a colonel, who ultimately became the commandant of Berlin, he was his office was below ours, and the lieutenant colonel, his second in command, was below ours too. And then I did typing. After I had been to shorthand school, they thought I could do anything. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> that wasn't true. But I was there at a desk. I answered the phone, and, and one time uh, the division somebody at the division uh, headquarters uh, called this office and I would answer the phone and, and they said, I need to speak to Lieutenant Schaus. And I said, uh, Schaus is not here right now. He left. He said, who are you? And I said, I'm Corporal Stravers. He said, that's not Schaus. That's Lieutenant Schaus, Corporal. I said, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one day, the, uh, <laughs> the, when the Lieutenant Colonel came in, well, I had an Italian barber. We all did. But he let my sideburns grow long, mm -hmm. my hair grew long. And he was a real tall guy. And uh, he said, before he left, he said, Lieutenant? Tell your corporal to get his hair cut. <laughs> and then after he left, Lieutenant Chow said, you heard what the colonel said. So then I got a brush cut, and this is, this, this is what I looked like for, for long after that. Let's see <laughs> if I can get that. I kept a brush cut go. after I got home. And <laughs> Yes. All right. Now you were talking a little bit before about uh, yes. May Day, which was Communist Party oh, Day. Oh yes. So, so what was the concern oh, or the oh, issue there? Oh, t good. Tito said we're taking back Trieste, and the rumor was that the tanks, Tito's tanks, were at the border, and our first sergeant, the first sergeant of our company, um, uh, told us. We all had to pick up our M1 rifles with live ammunition and even sleep with them. And he was livid. He was, he must have been in battle in World War II. He was scared silly. He was white. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but this is something that, you know, I told you, I'd, we never went to the firing range, mm -hmm. so I thought, man, I hope this doesn't happen. I don't know. I don't know how to do use this gun. <laughs> and then, but then he, he backed off somehow. I don't know all the details of that. But it, it, I thought, boy, we're going to be in war yet for us. Then during that time in Trieste, when um, officers' wives would go to the PX, to, just like to go to the grocery store mm -hmm. here. They, they ha had an armed, uh, non-commissioned person to go with them in the Jeep to protect them. Well, we all had to take our turns. And I took my turn, and I thought, ma'am, you don't know it, but I've got a rifle here, but I don't know how to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, <laughs> that was that was bad actually, but right. there was no problem. Okay. So was it common for the officers' wives to be there, or just yes, yes, and uh, uh, part of my job was to 
type, the, the officers got uh, evaluated. I don't know if it was once a year or twice, but the colonel did that, mm -hmm. and then it was my job to type those, and so I got to read all those assessments, <laughs> and if an officer, uh, if his wife was back in America, and if he was messing around with women in Italy, oh man, he really took them to task. Oh, he had no room in his thinking for that. <laughs> and then, once in a while, I would correct a semicolon to a column, to a cool. comma, okay. or yeah. vice versa. Yeah. He would shoot those back to me so fast and said, Corporal, type that the way I sent it to you. <laughs> so he probably was more correct than I, but he was a, I never met him personally, but we communicated like that. He was a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And so then, and we took, uh, the, the Army was good in taking us, there was a good uh, swimming place in the Adriatic. And they would take us there in the summer, every weekend, probably every weekend. And and one weekend, uh, I didn't learn to swim in Iowa. And here, I was I was swimming from the from the shore to a float out in the middle of that little bay. And I thought, hey, I'm making progress. And then one time, I forgot to kick my legs and so I went down, went down once, came up, went down a second time and my friends were standing on that float just laughing at me and the third time I said, I need help and then a, a little guy whom we called Red Berry from Philadelphia, he jumped in, they, they weren't going to let me drown but they sure were making me sweat it out. He came in, grabbed me, and swam me to shore at Redbury. His father was a policeman in Philadelphia and got shot on duty and killed. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so then after nine months or so, the, they, they closed down, no, they didn't close that operation down in Trieste. But several of us, our enlistment period was almost up. So then they decided to send us back home. And coming back home, we were on a, a ship called a, a General. That, that was a different level. Mm -hmm. And it went faster and uh, held more troops. And But on the way home, in the mid-Atlantic, there was a huge storm, and the guy on the loudspeaker said it was going to be heavy rolling, so we're ordering you all to go to your bunks down below, and it was it was 11 o'clock at night. Well, one couple disobeyed. They were making out <laughs> on the deck, and the gal um, Sergeant Rookie was her name. She got washed overboard in the middle of the night into those rough waters. And and when, um, I suppose the captain of the ship, when he heard about that, uh, he said, be sure to stay down below um, and we're going to see if someone really is missing. And she was. And so they turned the ship around. It took an hour and a half, and they turned on the lights, really, really bright, bright lights, because we did walk up far enough so we could see out. And she was in the water for an hour and a half. She was a, a champion swimmer, sergeant rookie, and by golly, they they got her, and they, and they put in a. A, a life raft, but it was so rough they couldn't 
get that back on board the ship, so they just let that go. But then when she got close to the ship, then her friend with whom she uh, got too friendly on the on the deck, he had a yeah what do you call it? a life jacket yeah. a life jacket, but didn't know that. If you jump in, you got to do this. He jumped in, and that was quite a drop from the deck of the ship to the ocean, and knocked him right out. So they had to save him too. <laughs> and then Sergeant Rookie got got uh, court-martialed when she got back to Camp Kilmer. Well, did her it, boyfriend get court-martialed too? I don't know, but there was an article in the papers, and. I didn't read that he did, but she got court-martialed, okay. yes. Now, uh, did you have a lot of women personnel in, in your unit or in Italy? No, we did okay. not. No, it didn't have any women in, that. Okay. in our unit in Trieste or Tarvigil, no mm -hmm. women, no. All right. No. So it, it seemed a, a little odd that they would have women traveling with the yes, men. Now, he, on, on the ship, were they supposed to be in a separate part of the ship, or? Well, I don't even know that. I don't even know that. And we had no no people of color mm -hmm. either. Uh, anywhere I was stationed, we had no people of color. Yeah. And, yeah. And then, that's right around the time when Truman starts to desegregate. Yes. But your unit was already formed and in place yes, at that point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Now, if you think back to that time in Italy, are there other events that stand out in your memory or things oh. you haven't talked about yet? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, we had, we got paid in uh, army script, mm -hmm. you know about that term, so not in dollars. We weren't supposed to have any American money. We were supposed to get rid of that before we boarded the ship for Italy, mm -hmm. but I kept four dollars. <laughs> I should have kept more, because <laughs> that a dollar was worth a lot over there. Well, but then we got um, script, and uh, the Italians loved that too. They could use that. So when I would, I didn't smoke, but we had a cigarette ration. Mm -hmm. So I think I could buy two cartons of cigarettes every week or every payday. I don't know, but I would get those cigarettes, and uh, the Italians were waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they knew who I was, and they would buy those cigarettes and pay in lira. I had more lira than I could spend, and I got paid $104 a month by the Army, and uh, I put 100 of, of that in a bank, in the bank every, every payday, and I had $4 left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it was... That was a wonderful time in my life. Right. Yeah. So you get back, you survive your storm, you get back to Camp Kilmer. Yeah. Do they discharge you there, or did they no. send you somewhere else, no. or then, what happens? Then we we had uh, they asked us. Um, see, we fib, we fibbed a little bit. Do uh, you think you might re-enlist? They tried to get us to re-enlist in Italy already. But mm -hmm. No, no. I thought if I don't go home, I, my girlfriend will be out of the picture. <laughs> and so then when we got to Camp Kilmer, they asked us the same thing. Yeah, well, we think we might, which that was a lie. <laughs> and so and so my buddy and I, he, we, where would you like to go? To the West Coast. So I got to go to Fort Ord, California. And he went to Fort Lewis, Washington. So, but that was a, kind of like a mistake. It was so boring there. Oh, it was boring. Three more months, and then, and then we got, we got discharged. I got discharged at Fort Ord. Okay. So, so you hadn't actually re-enlisted. No, I did but not. But because, you, but you had a few months left three, on your enlistment. Three months okay. left. Yeah. And because you said you were going to maybe re-enlist, they yeah. sent you where you wanted to go. That's right. I thought, man, I get to go all the way across the country. And the train was so full of people. 
it was a sleeper, a Pullman sleeper, and it was so full that this buddy of mine, uh, we slept together on the upper bunk, but boy was that crowd. <laughs> but all the way from, no, we, we, we went back home for mm -hmm. a month yeah. and then went on to California when that month was up and, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Now, while, while you were in Italy, uh, how much communication did you have with people at home? At home? Yeah. Oh, my girlfriend wrote regularly mm -hmm. and I wrote them regularly and my mother wrote every week, mm -hmm. every week. And when I was in college, she did the same thing. All right. She went into the eighth grade, had wonderful penmanship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my father never wrote a letter. She tried to get him to do so, but <laughs> that, was, right. that was not his thing. All right. So when do you get out of the Army then? 1948. Okay. March, I think. And then after you get out of the Army, what do you do next? Well, then... I wanted to go to college, but you don't start college in March. So I got a job with uh, the Pella Light Company. Uh, they made the electricity for the whole city, mm -hmm. and they needed somebody, and I got a job with them as a, one of the grunts down below, mm -hmm. and then sending stuff up the pole to the guy working up there, and I did that until I went back to college, and then I still, and then that was, I, I went to Central College in Pella, Iowa mm -hmm. for the first year, and then after that, Ruth and I both went to Calvin College in Grand Rapids, and that's what brought us to Michigan. All right. But a sad thing happened when I was a grunt helping this guy up on the pole that was high voltage and he said Dick don't let me go way to the top without my gloves well um, somebody had been careless and and let a, a part of the line hang down high voltage mm -hmm. but he wasn't at the top so I wasn't concerned all of a sudden I heard and he was electrocuted. Wow. It was really sad. Yeah. Okay. Sad. All right. uh, and then, uh, once you graduated from college, what kind of work did you do? Oh, then I became a Latin teacher. Okay. In high school, in the Grand Rapids Christian High School, and that was that was a godsend too. The the they had three full-time Latin teachers at that time, and I did my practice teaching in mathematics, but one of the three Latin teachers had been uh, injured badly in World War II, and if someone dropped a book on the floor, mm -hmm. I don't know if they ever did it intentionally, but he would, he would just go bananas. So he, he really had to take a lot of time off. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, teaching in math class with a really good professional teacher, I got to teach those Latin classes all on my own. Oh. And then when that year was done, then they hired me. And I taught Latin there for five years. And then I felt called to go to the seminary to become a preacher. So I'm a retired preacher. And uh, when I was in seminary, then I taught Latin part-time at Calvin College. Okay. Yeah. And where were you a preacher? What churches were you well, in? Well, in Cleveland, Ohio, Kalamazoo, Michigan, on Calvin's campus. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to that same church in Cleveland. It was my first pastor and my last one. And okay. And so and then, why did you come back to Michigan? Well, we had lived well. We had lived in Grand Rapids for a number of years, of mm -hmm. course, and uh, lived in Kalamazoo, serving a church. And 
we thought we would probably, when we retired in 1992, my wife was a teacher, and so we were both worked full time, we both retired at the same time. We thought we'd probably live in Kalamazoo or Grand Rapids having served churches there, mm -hmm. but our youngest daughter moved to Holland and she kept sending us pictures of houses for sale. Mm -hmm. Said, Mom and Dad, we think you would really like Holland and we love Holland. <laughs> and we moved to this building a year and a half ago and we absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. We just love living here. <laughs> All right. Now, as you look back over your time in the service, yeah. um, how do you think that affected you, or what did you learn from it? Well, yeah, what did I learn from it? I learned, well, I learned shorthand for one thing, <laughs> and, and I learned to uh, communicate and be friends with people from all over America, uh, mm -hmm. a very diverse group, but as I said, no people of color, mm -hmm. but we did have, uh, uh, in where we lived in Tarvigio, there was a Japanese in our room, mm -hmm. and so, and a guy from Mobile, Alabama, he had such an accent, so we became friends mm -hmm. with a variety of people. I learned that, and yeah. And I, I guess I learned to uh, mostly to follow orders. <laughs> like what, what, what? Going back to Trieste, I was visiting um, a friend in another concert hut, and the captain of our company came by, Captain Proctor from Texas. I remember him, and I was lying on the, the bed in that. Quonset, and so I didn't even think he saw me, but man, he saw me, and uh, I should have stood up and, mm -hmm. and saluted. He bawled me out, and he said, "Report to Lieutenant Schaus and tell him what happened." And I never did. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I did have, when we were in Camp, Camp Kilmer getting ready to go over to Italy, the, the, either a lieutenant or a captain in charge of us uh, t during that little while was um, a black officer, mm -hmm. and he was absolutely wonderful, wonderful, so congenial. So helpful, mild. Oh, I thought, what's this race business all about? He's yeah. such a wonderful man. <laughs> and, and probably kind of a contrast from basic training. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's right. Where there were no blacks, but. <laughs> yeah, and the sergeants no. weren't weren't as nice to you. But. No, <laughs> no, you didn't. You wouldn't want to be friends with them. <laughs> all right. Well, the whole thing makes for a pretty good story. So well, just like to okay. Thank you for taking the time for sharing it today. You're welcome. All right. Thank you.